Okay, we're ready for our story in Champions of the King, the story of the apostles, and we're going to read the chapter called Elihu ben Malchus, the Bible and the book The Ways of the Master. In this book, all talk about the stories of what happened in the New Testament, the book Acts of the Apostles, and other epistles, particularly that Paul wrote, but they're not all necessarily exactly in the same place at the same time. Elihu ben Malchus. Help! Help me, Malchus screamed. Somebody help! Elihu sprang to his father's sleeping mat. Wake up! Wake up! You're having another nightmare. No, no, it's real, he shouted. Yeshua of Nazareth, he's got a sword. The son put his arms around his father. Wake up, Abba. Nobody's going to hurt you. Dripping with cold perspiration and shaking, Malchus opened his eyes. There's no one here, he asked. No one but me. Where's your mother? She's serving late in the house of the high priest. Remember they had a big feast tonight? Oh, where is Yeshua? Abba, don't you remember Yeshua was crucified? It was a long time ago. I was just a little boy then. The man shook his head. I could have sworn he was in here. He had his sword and was going to hurt me, like last time. It wasn't Yeshua that hurt you. One of his servants cut your ear off, and Yeshua picked it up and put it back on. Yeshua cared about you. He healed you, even though you were part of the party that arrested him. Oh, yes, the older man mumbled. He put, his, he put my ear back. He reached up and felt it. It's still there. Elihu laughed shakily. Yes, apparently he put it on pretty well. It would be easy to become one of his followers, Malchus said. A look of pain crossed Elihu's face, although in the darkness I was the only one who could see it. Really, he asked. Really, Abba? If it would be that easy, why don't you become one? Hugging himself, Malchus started to rock back and forth in the dark and moaned softly. I can't. I just can't. Oh, it's so hard. You don't understand. Then tell me, his son said gently. Malchus continued to rock. I have such an important position. It, it just wouldn't be right. I owe some loyalty to the family of the high priest. I've been their servant all my life. I have an important position, you know, he repeated. I watched the look of pain get deeper on Elihu's face. The father did once have an important position. If the high priest had told Elihu that Malchus had an evil spirit and that he was going insane, the religious leaders ordered the son to keep him out of their sight or his family would all be thrown out into the streets. So far, it had worked out well. Malchus did only the most menial task on the days when he was capable of doing anything other than rocking and mumbling to himself in the house. Elihu and his mother still served the priestly family and were able to keep their rooms in the servants' quarters. Abba, Elihu said with his arms around him, you would be so much happier if you would just pick one or the other. This indecision is killing you and it is destroying your mind. Oh, you just don't understand, his father protested. Nobody understands me. I have such an important position. There are so many issues. You don't know. You're just young. Elihu took a deep breath. Have a drink of water, Father. Maybe that will help you go back to sleep. And I have to lie back down now. I must leave early in the morning. Yes, I know. Let's both get our sleep. Morning found Elihu out before dawn. He made eye contact with a man near the temple gate and followed him down into a little back street. There are big plans for Passover, Elihu whispered to him as soon as they paused in a dark corner. They are going to arrest James. We've moved him to a new spot he's hiding at. Stop, don't tell me. If I'm questioned and I don't know, I cannot betray his hiding place. Just make sure he is well hidden and protected. The other man nodded and Elihu returned to the temple. Passover was the busiest time of the year, and he was as well as the temple staff, had many things to do. 
Glancing around, he decided that no one had followed him. Hopefully, nobody had been watching from the rooftops either. He shrugged. Sometimes he just had to trust that Yeshua would send a few extra angels to protect them all. Working in the house of a high priest was a dangerous place for a follower of the way. Elihu ben Malchus hurried up the steps of the temple. It was not even light yet, but he needed an early start. Passover was such a busy time, and there were so many things to do to prepare for it. He was no longer the wiry little boy he had been at the time Yeshua of Nazareth taught in the temple courtyard. Now he was the tallest of the high priest's servants and the stockiest. As he smiled wryly, he wondered if it was more of a curse than a blessing. It seemed the more his father shrunk into the frightened little man that he had become, the more Elihu had grown and the more advantage the high priest took of it. Shaking his head, he tried to dispel the morbid thoughts. Now, Elihu, he said to himself, stop that. You gave your life to Yeshua of Nazareth. You pray and ask his father to guide you every day, just as he did. And if he still wants you to work here in the temple, then you must do so until he guides you otherwise. Elihu wrinkled his nose at the stench of burning sacrifices. While he would work here today, he didn't have to enjoy it. He stood in his position on the steps as the sheep merchants arrived to set up their booths beside the money changers. How Elihu despised all of them. As light broke over the horizon, he stepped down from the steps to the first animal booth. What? its owner demanded crossly. You know what? Elihu replied with a sigh. We go through this every year. I paid my temple taxes, the man protested. Yes, you did, and now you need to pay rent for your booth and a percentage of the sheep for the priests. There's nothing about this in the law of Moses. Elihu laughed bitterly. No, this is the law of Caiaphas, but you still have to pay. Grumbling, the merchant passed over the required coinage. Now remember, Elihu added, you also need to pay 10% of the switchovers. As he went to the next booth, Elihu shook his head and sighed. That practice per particularly disgusted him. The switchovers were the sheep that the priest rejected as not good enough to sacrifice to God. The weary pilgrims would go back out to buy a perfect lamb from the vendors since they had to have a sacrifice. The sheep merchants would offer them a low price for their imperfect animals, but at least it would help toward the price of an acceptable one. As soon as the worshiper had left, the vendor would put the rejected lamb in with the rest of the stock since usually there was nothing wrong with them anyway. These animals were considered switchovers and were how the animal vendors made an extra profit during Passover. Elihu hated that honest worshipers were getting cheated. Even more, he detested the fact that the high priest, who was supported by the temple taxes and the sacrifices outlined in the law, would cheat honest worshipers and be a part of such a scheme. How offensive it must be to God, he thought, then smiled grimly as he remembered Yeshua throwing everyone out of the courtyard. How I miss him, he mumbled. You said something? The next sheep vendor asked him. No, Elihu said quickly, nothing. Do you have your payment ready? What are you going to do if I don't? The man snarled. Beat me up? Elihu took a deep breath. No, I'm physically able, but I don't beat people up. You see those men over there? He pointed to the elite temple guard. The man nodded nervously. They would thrash you. Why don't you just pay it? Because there's nothing we can do about it. The sheep farmer looked suspiciously at Elihu and passed over the money. Elihu was not even halfway through the courtyard when a few huge scuffle broke out behind him. The knot of anger, angry and shouting people burst its way through the entry and up the steps and into the courtyard. The temple guard rushed down. Elihu turned and walked over. One of the priests had run down the steps with undue haste. Have you got him, he asked. Right here, someone in the mob yelled back. The men parted, revealing a badly beaten man laying on the ground. 
The guard poked him with the end of his staff. Stand up! The man struggled to his feet. One of his arms hung at an awkward angle, and he picked it up by his limp wrist and held it close to him. That's obviously broken, Elihu said, staring at the arm. Suddenly, recognition flashed into his mind. This wasn't just anyone. The victim of the mob was James. James the Believer. James the brother of John and one of the best friends of Yeshua of Nazareth. Elihu felt as if his stomach had dropped down into his feet. What could he do? He drew closer. Excellent, the priest told the mob. He turned to James. I can't tell you how pleased we are to see you. For a moment, Elihu made eye contact with James. The leader of the way shook his head almost imperceptibly, but enough that Elihu knew he was telling him not to intervene. Elihu walked as casually as he could up the steps to Caiaphas. What are you going to do with this man, he asked. The high priest laughed gleefully. It's a little present to Annas. Don't say I can't pick out just the perfect gift for an occasion as important as the Passover. Elihu tried to smile. A member of the way, I suppose? Yes, Caiaphas said. He's one of the three main leaders. Don't you recognize him? After glancing at the battered James, Elihu replied, It's hard to recognize a face that isn't there anymore. Ah, oh, how true. I'm going to send him over to Herod. The Romans are useless for this kind of thing, but I think we can get what we want from him. Probably so. Well, Caiaphas continued, we can't stand around here chatting all day. You have fees to collect. Yes, I sh guess I should get back to that. With a heavy heart, he walked back down the steps. He had to keep working. Caiaphas was watching him. What else could he do? How could he save James? God, show me what to do, he cried inside of himself. As he tried to keep his face emotionless, show me what to do. But the leaden skies were silent. Since Elihu was not temple staff, but in the personal service of Caiaphas, his job was wherever the high priest was and whatever he was told to do. He stood in the background as Caiaphas entertained dignitaries at dinner. Passover was a time when people came from all over the world to Jerusalem to worship, and it was a time for the finest dining and entertaining in all of the wealthy homes. The priests were no exception. Suddenly, a messenger slipped in and, apologizing, whispered something in the air of Caiaphas. The high priest's face turned dark red and then purple. Why did he do that? he exploited. How dare he ruin my plans? Elihu stepped forward, anticipating immediate orders, but none came. Caiaphas continued to shout, I had him arrested so that we could have a public execution and make a point. What is wrong with that little weasel Herod? How can he be afraid of these uneducated little peasants? Why do the Romans even let him rule? Immediately, a little knot of priests formed at the head of the table and soon Caiaphas quieted down. He gave a few apologies and excused himself from the dinner. As soon as he could, Elihu slipped into the kitchen where his mother was working. Have you heard, he asked her. She nodded, not looking up from her work. I wanted to help, her son mumbled. Now it's too late. His mother reached out and rubbed his shoulder. Elihu. There's only one Savior. Tears rolled down his cheeks in spite of himself. It just seems that because I'm working here, I could have done something. His mother looked him in the eye. You stay alive, she said. Your time will come when he will need you. But you stay here until he tells you and stay alive. Brushing his tears away, he once again hid behind his emotionless expression. We need more meat in the other room. They're almost fin they've almost finished those platters. I'll see to it immediately. Now, go check on your father. When Elihu walked into the kitchens, the excitement in the air was almost palpable. He reported to the head steward. 
Today, you need to stick near Caiaphas in case he needs you for personal errands. They arrested that big fisherman, one of the leaders of the way. Our master is in a much better mood today. He will discuss the details of a public execution with Herod. Hopefully, there will still be time left during the Passover celebration. His face completely impassive, Elihu nodded. For now, have some breakfast, the steward continued. The high priest is up, but he's having a private meeting in his chambers with Annas and some of the other priests. As soon as they're done, I imagine you'll be gone all day. When Elihu sat down and tried to eat, everything stuck in his throat. Now they had Peter, too. He closed his eyes tight. Yeshua, are you seeing this? Are you watching? Are you going to do anything? Silently, Elihu waited as Caiaphas paced back and forth in front of the prisoner. Well, he said, we've got you now. We killed James and your precious Yeshua did nothing about that. That's because he's dead. The high priest spat the word dead as if it tasted bad. Yes, Peter said, you've killed James. It was an honor for him to serve Yeshua of Nazareth, son of God. And it was an honor for James to die for him, too. My fellow leader was completely devoted to him. Well, the high priest snapped, with any luck, we'll be able to honor you in the same way this weekend. Only we're hoping for a public execution this time. Peter met him with a level gaze. Your plans with James didn't completely work out. Silence, the religious leader shouted. You will speak only when spoken to. I take my orders from Yeshua of Nazareth, Peter replied gently. If you've been able to arrest me, it's because he has allowed it. And if he allows you to put me to death, then that's his will too. But if he is not willing to allow it now, there's nothing you'll be able to do about it. I'm content to wait and see what his intent is for me. Get him out of here, Caiaphas shrieked. He turned to Herod. You've been unusually quiet. Oh, Herod replied abstractedly. I was just listening. Um, guards, place him in the dungeon. Rotate four squads with him. Chain two guards to each wrist. Then we'll see what this Yeshua can do for him. Peter smiled. Four squads. I rate 16 soldiers. It seems you respect Yeshua and his power too. Come on, a guard ordered, yanking Peter by the chains on his wrist. Let's get you to the dungeon before you make them so angry that they execute you in the great hall. Elihu drew a deep breath. Yeshua, are you watching, he whispered inside his head. Are you seeing this? Do you have a plan? I smiled. There was always a plan. Humans just couldn't always see what it was. The fact that sometimes followers of Yeshua die discourages them, and they forget that there is still a master plan, and that while the enemy takes temporary soldiers, temporary prisoners. It doesn't change the outcome of the battle. I wanted to scoop him up in my arms and whisper that everything's going to be fine. But I stood as I was supposed to and proudly watched my charge standing as he was supposed to, although with less confidence than I. The rest of the day, Elihu kept busy delivering messages from the priest back and forth to various members of the Sanhedrin and to Herod. This is your last one, Caiaphas said, handing him a scroll that the scribes had just sealed. You've had a long day. Thank you, Elihu said. His stomach had been in a knot all day as he had heard the plans for a public execution of the fishermen. He had been racking his brains, yet could come up with nothing that could save Peter now. Who could help him in a dungeon? And even if he could get in, the guards would outnumber him. Sixteen men assigned to watch one man. He shook his head. I guess the only thing I can do is pray about it, he mumbled. I almost laughed. 
Why do humans think that their actions are so important and resort to prayer only as a last resort when their prayers are the most powerful help that they can employ? Perhaps he would learn as he got older. Darting into an alley, he watched carefully to see if anyone had followed him. When he was certain that no one was paying him any attention, he turned the other direction and headed for the house with the large upper room. He had heard that many in the way were up there praying for Peter's release. Since he could think of nothing else to do, he decided to join them. Knocking on the door, he gave the secret password. Have you any news of Peter? Rhoda, the young servant minding the door, asked him. None. I've just come from the home of Caiaphas. Peter is still in the dungeon. The execution is planned for tomorrow. She burst into tears. Come this way, she said finally. Everyone is upstairs. Although believers crowded the room, it was very quiet except for the whisper of prayers. Fear had snaked its tentacles through the room and seemed to have a good grasp on everyone. Not knowing what else to do, he just stood with the others and began to pray too. Hours passed, but no one was hungry and no one wanted to leave. Elihu was glad he had told his mother not to worry about him tonight. It looked as if they would be there all night. Later, Elihu was not sure how much time had passed, but it seemed as if it would be morning before long. All of the believers were still huddled together and still praying quietly among themselves. Everyone was nervous and jumped at the slightest sound. Suddenly, they heard a pounding on the door downstairs. Everyone froze. Accusing eyes turned to Elihu. Have you betrayed us too? asked one believer. No wonder they knew where to come for Peter and James. No, no, I didn't, he protested. I'm a believer too. Aren't you a servant of Caiaphas? Elihu gulped and nodded. Yes, it's true. I have not known what else to do so far. Right, someone muttered. John Mark's mother, the owner of the home, strode over and put her hand on Rhoda's shoulder. Please answer the door. It does not do to keep them waiting, whether they are friends or enemies come to arrest us. And you, she turned to Eli Elihu's accusers, leave him alone. It's best not to make accusations unless you know for sure. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? One person countered. Maybe. Then, linking her arm through Elihu, she said, Come over here by the fire. She led him to the small coal brazier set up in the center of the room to ward off the night chill. Stay away from them, she said. They're just scared, and when people's fright exceeds their faith, they can get nasty. He smiled weakly, since it had never occurred to him that the believers would be afraid of him or view him as a spy. He didn't know what to say. Suddenly, Rhoda's feet pounded up the stairs and she burst into the room. It's Peter! It's Peter! I can't believe it! She was laughing and crying all at once. It's Peter! It really is! Right, said the man who had been accusing Elihu moments before. Your fear has made you start seeing things. Maybe she's not crazy, another person suggested. Maybe they've executed him too and this is his angel in his form come to let us know of his fate. Did you open the door? John Mark's mother asked the girl. Uh, no, I was so surprised, but it's really Peter. The woman shook her head. Rhoda, go back down and open the door. Bring him in. If it really is Peter, it hardly does to let him stand out in the same street where he can get arrested again. The girl raced back down the stairs. Everyone stood motionless. Could it really be Peter? Deciding to find out for himself, Elihu hurried down to the door. Several others followed him. He immediately recognized the person standing at the gate. When Peter saw them and everyone began asking questions all at once, he motioned for them to be quiet. The others fell silent. I was chained to the walls in the dungeon, Peter began, and I had two Romans chained to each side of me so I really couldn't move at all without disturbing one of them, too. I'm sure they love that, someone muttered as Moore crowded into the courtyard by the gate. 
They weren't happy about it. Since they had taken off my robes and my sandals, I was in just my undergarment, which was pretty chilly on that stone floor. People nodded. Everyone had heard tales about what prisons were like. I was sleeping, and so were they, when suddenly an angel awakened me. I think he prodded me on the shoulder a couple of times. Several of the apostles burst out laughing. Barnabas turned to Elihu and said, That's how you can tell it's a true story. Even an angel can't wake Peter up by just speaking to him. It's amazing those Romans got any sleep at all if Peter fell asleep first. The fisherman was known for his thunderous snoring. Do you want to hear my story or not? Peter protested. Yes, yes, go on, Barnabas replied. The angel awakened me and told me to get dressed, handed me my clothes and my sandals. The change just fell off and the Romans never moved a whisker. All of them? asked one believer. Everyone on guard duty, sleeping more soundly than I ever have. Then the angel led me to the gate. It just fell open. He didn't even touch it. All the sentries at the gates were asleep, too. I followed him clear out into the street, past the iron gate that leads into the city. It swung open and clanged shut behind us, and then he left me, so I came here. God be praised, someone said, and the room broke into praises and prayers. You see, Peter said, we have no reason to be afraid. Some of us may die, and some of us may be beaten. But it's not going to happen unless the Lord allows it. And when he does, he will give us the courage that we need to deal with it. And in the meantime, if he has other plans for us, all the schemes that the Romans and the priest made are worth knowing, or are worth nothing. I smiled as I watched the celebrating humans. If only they could remember this all the time, how much anguish it would save them. It was almost morning. The sky was getting lighter as the believers began to leave in little knots of two and three from the house so as not to be conspicuous. Peter turned to Elihu. You, young man, he said, you are a servant of Caiaphas. Yes, I thought I recognized you. It is time for you to leave the house of the priest. You are in danger. Elihu looked at the ground. My father is ill and my mother works for them too. They need me. The women had stood to one side, for though the men and women of the way mixed more freely than the Jews of Jerusalem did, they still were more comfortable in separate groups. A heavily veiled woman approached Peter. As she lifted her veil, Elihu recognized her. Mother? It is time, my son, she said. I have been praying about this for years, and I knew that this time would come. But what about father? What about you? I can't leave you. You're in danger too. No, I don't believe that I am. And as long as your father lives, I will be there to care for him. He's my husband, but you are in danger and the fisherman is right. We have been praying for years that Yeshua would let us know when the time was right. So now that he's telling us we must not ignore him. But what am I going to do? Where should I go? Did he tell you that? My son is going on a journey soon, the woman who had brought him over to the brazier said. He's about your age. Where is he going? Elihu's mother asked. I'm not sure, but he's going to travel with Barnabas, whom your son met earlier here, and Saul. You mean the one who has, was, has persecuted the way? Elihu said in surprise. The very one, she smiled. They want to share the word with the Gentiles. I see, Elihu's mother said, but do they have a definite plan yet? Not that I know of, John Mark's mother replied. Well, Elihu's mother said after thinking a moment, I have a sister who lives in Lystra. Lystra? That's a long way from Judea. Well, yes, she was kind of a disappointment to our family. It seems she married a Greek and moved there although she still worships the God of Israel. My sister just, well, she married a Greek. What can I say? Anyway, they live in Lystra, and I believe they have a son about the same age as my son. Well, John Mark's mother said, it's possible that they may plan their route through there and could take Elihu with them. He could stay in Lystra, where he would be safe. The high priest has no influence there. 
The Lord is always able to work things out, Elihu's mother observed. If he can get Peter out of jail with all those soldiers guarding him, I'm sure getting Elihu to Lystra is a small thing. The woman laughed. Let's talk to them, she said. By the next day, Peter had left for Caesarea. Elihu had met Mark. His name was John Mark, but Elihu just called him Mark because he knew too many Johns. He had talked more with Barnabas, and they were making plans for the journey. But Elihu was sure the trip would go fine and could hardly keep his mind on his duties while he waited for them to decide a definite time of departure. Even Caiaphas noted his absent-minded behavior and mentioned it after having to speak to him twice about a message he delivered. I apologize, Eli, he said. I have not slept well the past few nights. My father, you know. The high priest nodded. Yes, I'm sure it must be difficult. However, I need you to have your mind on your work here, or you will be useless to me. As useless as your father has become, he muttered under his breath be loud enough for Elihu to hear. Although Elihu's face reddened, he said nothing. He hoped he could leave soon. The guardians hovered near the boat, about to depart on the Mediterranean journey, as they had on the land journey up to Seleucia in Syria. Saul and the young John Mark lay below deck, propped against the side of the boat, doing their best to keep their stomachs stable. Tempers were short and became shorter as the two became more seasick. Barnabas remained below, trying to keep the two from arguing and occasionally offering sips of water. Elihu stayed up on deck. He would far rather take the stinging salt spray in his face than Saul's hostility toward Mark. He thought Caiaphas had been the most caustic person he'd ever met in his life, but apparently he was wrong. His spirits lifted as the harbor of Salamis came into view. It was beautiful. Is that it? he asked one of the sailors. Is this Cyprus? Sure is, the sailor replied cheerfully. The best harbor on the island. It has deep water, which makes it easy for even the largest ships to come in here. Because of that, all the finest copper, flax, wine, fruit, and honey are traded here and then exported to all the Mediterranean ports nearby. I wonder if there are any Jews here, Elihu mused to himself. There are, the sailor told him. I didn't realize I said that out loud, Elihu said, embarrassed. Oh, don't worry about it. Jews are always searching each other out. And there's a pretty good colony here. You'll probably be able to find friends that you knew in other places. We've taken a lot of Jews to hear from different ports, especially since some controversy a few years back. A person named Stephen was stoned and people began fleeing Judea. It's kind of settled down a little now, but you never know when it might start back up again. Elihu nodded. He wondered what the sailor would say if he knew that Saul, who had been the ringleader of the persecution of the way, was below deck. He decided this wasn't the time to mention that fact. Upon leaving the ship, Barnabas and Elihu found lodging for their two seasick companions, where they could clean up and rest until they recovered their land legs. Would you like to go look around Salamis while these two rest? Barnabas asked. I have some friends here. Elihu broke into a wide grin. That sounded much better than waiting for their two companions to get over their seasickness and become friendly again. <coughs> Excuse me. I followed the two on their explorations. After all, I was recording Elihu's choices. The guardians could take care of the other two. As they wandered through the market, Elihu drank in the new sights and sounds and smells. Cyprus is a beautiful place, he blurted out at one point. Barnabas nodded. Yes, but then I would think so because it's my home. My calling is in Antioch right now, but every time I get an opportunity, I come back here. I can understand why, Elihu said. Over there is the citadel, Barnabas pointed. Elihu glanced in that direction. Who lives there? The proconsul of the island. His name is Sergius Paulus. I wish we could see the inside of the palace, Elihu said wistfully. 
Barnabas raised an eyebrow. Well, I guess it depends on why one is inside the palace as to whether it would be much fun. What do you mean? If you get invited there as a guest, it would be pretty marvelous, and you would probably enjoy it. But if the authorities dragged you in there because you were in trouble, it would not be much fun. Oh, I hadn't even thought about that. Do you think that Sergius Paulus will give us a hard time? I don't know, Barnabas said. He always seemed to be a pretty reasonable man, but I don't think that they have had conflicts here with Christ's followers yet. We'll find out. Elihu still wished he could see the inside of the palace, although the idea of appearing there as a prisoner sounded frightening. Paul and the young John Mark were soon feeling better and began traveling all over the island preaching about Jesus. One day the four of them had been walking for hours. As they crested a little hill, a beachside village came into view. Barnabas took a deep, satisfied sigh and said, It's Kittyon, my home. Really, Elihu asked, do you have family there? Some, and friends, and if things have gone well, perhaps some friends from Jerusalem, too. They hurried down the hill and approached a house. Barnabas knocked and called out, It's Barnabas! The door flung open, and much shouting and hugging followed as Barnabas greeted everyone. Then, turning to his three companions, he said, I have guests with me, and he introduced them. A tall man, who had been busily hugging Barnabas and slapping him on the back, turned pale, and his jaw clenched. How can you bring this man into our home and put all of our lives in danger, he demanded. Please, Lazarus, he's my guest, Barnabas whispered. The man frowned and said nothing. Friends, this is my family, Barnabas said, gesturing toward the people clustered by the door. This is my mother and my sister Mary. And this is Lazarus of Bethany, who moved here with the other Marys for safety during the persecution in Jerusalem. Saul silently looked at the ground while Lazarus's jaw clenched harder. This Mary is Jesus' mother, Barnabas continued, and this Mary is Lazarus' sister. Around here, if you just call Mary, one of them will come, he said with a smile. Mark and Elihu laughed at his little joke, then stopped quickly, realizing that the three of them were the only ones to find it amusing. The others stood with stony expressions. This is Saul, Barnabas said, pointing to the little man. He follows Christ now. So he says, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, fist. Saul raised his eyes to her. How can you hold my life before Christ against me? Enough, Lazarus exploded. Do you insult my sister in my own home? Stop, stop, Barnabas said, waving his arms. This is not how this was supposed to go. Jesus has challenged all of our lives. None of us would have been friends a few years ago, but he has brought us all together. He has forgiven and cleansed all of us. Saul has become a Christian and is a preacher of the good news about Christ. In his service, he has traveled many places and suffered many things, and it is not fair to hold his past against him any more than it is fair to remember Mary's past. And Lazarus, my friend, you were once a dead body. How would you feel if our fellow Jews treated you as unclean because of that fact? Lazarus almost cracked a smile. I hadn't thought of that. Small smiles teased at the corners of several mouths and the group became less tense. Let's start this over, Barnabas said after a moment. My family meet my friends, and my friends meet my family. We are one in Christ. Now we can do this without fighting with each other. Lazarus bowed. Friends of Barnabas and friends of Christ are welcome in my home. Please come in. Elihu enjoyed the days they spent in Kideon, Lazarus and the various Marys were hungry for news of Jerusalem. How's my sister Mary, the sister of Lazarus, inquired one day. Is she and her family well? Yes, Barnabas said, and they still live in your family home in Bethany. They have provided shelter and comfort for many Christians fleeing Jerusalem, and so far they have escaped the persecution. And do they have children? I know that when my sister Mary died, he had that young, red-headed son of his. Barnabas laughed. 
Well, now they have several running around, and your sister is very happy. She does all the organizing of any of our get-togethers there. Yes, she's the most organized person I, I know. I feel that when the gifts were given to us at birth, she got enough domestic gifts for the both of us, and so I didn't receive any. What about John? asked Mary, Jesus' mother. He is well, Barnabas answered, smiling at her. He sends his love, and as soon as he feels it is safe, he will come back for you and bring you to the family home. The catching up went on and on. Saul remained uncharacteristically quiet unless someone asked him a specific question. Mary, Jesus' mother, headed to where Eliu and Mark sat. You two look homesick, she said. Tell me about your families. Mark smiled. I don't think we've met before, but my mother owns the home where your son, the Christ, rented the room to celebrate Passover right before, before, well, you know. That's wonderful. I knew your mother well. She's a sweet woman. I'm sure she really misses you. His eyes glistened, and she tactfully turned to Elihu. What about your family, Elihu? Are you from Jerusalem, too? I am. My father and mother both work for Caiaphas, but my mother and I are followers of the Christ, though my mother has to do that secretly. And your father? Does he believe in my son? Elihu frowned. He can't make up his mind, and it has made him unwell. He was in the garden that night when Peter rushed up and tried to behead him with the sword. My father ducked just in time and had only his ear slashed off. Yeshua picked up father's ear from the ground and put it right back on his head, and it was as if it had never been wounded, except there was blood all over the place, so we could tell it had been. His ear has been fine since then, but his mind has not. I feel that if he decided one way or the other, he would be better off. But feeling torn and refusing to make a decision is destroying him. It's true, Mary said with a sigh. Indecision can be more destructive than a wrong choice sometimes. So how did you come to be with the group here? It was dangerous for followers of the Christ in the house of Caiaphas. My mother is sending me with Saul and Barnabas, hoping that in their travels they will go to Lystra. I have an aunt there. She's married to a Greek, so the family has been estranged from her for many years, but now her home seems to be a safe place to send me. I wanted to stay and help care for my father and protect my mother, but she insisted that I go. Mary nodded. You are a good and obedient son, and I believe God will bless you for honoring your mother and obeying her even when all your own instincts made you want to stay. God will care for her even more effectively than you could. She smiled. He honors the, obedient of the obedience of his followers. Both young men leaned against the wall and stared up at the star-dust room. Talking to Mary had made them miss their own families even more. It was late in the night when the visiting finished and the fire burned down to glowing coals. All right, a short time has passed. The two men leaned against a tree a short distance from where Saul was loudly preaching about Jesus. They had heard his sermon so many times that their minds were wandering this afternoon. Elihu was drawing in the sand with a stick. What is it? Mark asked when he noticed what the other was doing. Oh, it's a self-portrait. As he stared at it, Mark started laughing. Doesn't look like anything that I recognize here. Let me try. A few moments later, Mark stood up. Elihu studied it. What is that? Are you saying I'm a donkey? Sure, you're the beast of burden. We make you carry everything. Elihu laughed. Well, that's because you're the scribe, so you're supposed to be writing down everything that they say. Mark's smile slowly faded from his face. Well, what's the matter? Aren't you recording what they preach? I see you writing all the time. Yes, I am writing all the time. Well, you write, I carry things. Saul preaches. What about Barnabas? He's the fireman, Elihu said. Fireman? What do you mean? You're the one who always starts the fires in the evening. Elihu laughed. Those are just the cooking fires. Your cousin Barnabas stamps out all the fires that Saul starts by the way. Some people react to him. Think about it. Everywhere Saul has gone, eventually he's gotten thrown out of the place. 
Now he's with your cousin Barnabas, and Barnabas soothes over everyone's feelings and keeps him from starting big arguments. He hasn't been beaten or thrown out of any place since we've been here, although it almost happened in Kidion. They grinned at each other. You're right, Mark said. Perhaps God put my uncle and Saul together because Saul needed to learn some diplomatic skills, and maybe my uncle will become a little more assertive. He's terribly shy. It could be, Eli, he mused. My mother has often said that everyone in our life is there for a reason, that even if they are really annoying, there is something we can learn from them and that we should thank God for them and treat them as though he put them there on purpose instead of being upset at them. But it never made any sense to me until now. Mark stared at the ground. You're a, you're a better person than I am, Eli Hugh. What do you mean? We're all pretty equal now. The Christ died for us both, and we both needed a Savior. We were both sinners. Oh, it's not that. I just, I don't want to be part of this group anymore. I just want to go home. I know that there are things I could learn from Saul, and I know he's a great preacher. My uncle says he's the greatest preacher in the Christian movement right now, but we just don't get along. I think he really doesn't like me, so I just want to go home. At least you can go home, Elihu said with a smile. My life would have been in danger if I had remained in Jerusalem. I had to come, and I don't think I can go home for a long time. Both looked at each other for a moment, and then they both turned their attention back to the preaching, and nothing more was said. In another day, another town. Here we have our own son of Jesus here, someone shouted at Paul from the crowd. Yes, Elimus bar Jesus, others echoed. But Jesus of Nazareth, Saul protested, was the son of God. He could do miracles. Jesus healed the sick and even raised the dead. Well, our son of Jesus can do all kinds of miracles too, a townsperson exclaimed. You need to meet him. He's powerful. But Jesus of Nazareth, Saul continued. The crowd shouted him down. Get Elimus, get Elimus bar Jesus. Let him meet our son of Jesus. By now, no one could hear Saul. The crowd started chanting, Eliamus, Eliamus, Eliamus. Soon, an entourage approached the crowd. It was Eliamus. As he neared Saul, someone shouted out, Preacher of Jesus of Nazareth, meet Eliamus, son of Jesus. The evangelist nodded to the man. Eliamus put his hand out, and suddenly gold coins appeared in it. He threw them to the cheering crowd. It's your turn, Saul. What can you do, they shouted. What kind of power did Jesus of Nazareth give you? Saul remained silent. Reaching toward the evangelist, Eliamus seemed to pull some small sweet cakes from behind the preacher's shoulder. That's an unusual place to keep your lunch, he said. The crowd roared, and he tossed the treats to the crowd. This man is just a showman, Saul proclaimed, a magician. Jesus of Nazareth is a god. Eliamus is our prophet, someone said from the crowd. He's no prophet, Saul retorted. He's a cheap magician. A brawl appeared about to break out. Soldiers appeared on the periphery. What's the problem here, he de demanded the officer in charge. It's a contest of power, someone explained. Yes, between Jesus of Nazareth and Eliamus bar Jesus, another nodded. No, it's not Jesus of Nazareth. It's this Saul person, a third individual interrupted. Well, save it for the proconsul, the officer said. He wants to meet this Saul person anyway. As one of his advisors, you know he's fond of you, Eliamus. Let's all head back to the palace where we can settle this in a civilized way. Fine with me, Eliamus agreed. He turned to Saul. I am at the palace frequently. Have you ever been there? Saul looked like a thundercloud. Elihu's stomach twisted into a knot. Now he was going to see the inside of the palace, but was it a good thing? He wasn't sure. When at the palace Saul received permission to speak, he started to tell the story of Jesus of Nazareth to the proconsul. 
Over on the side, Eliamus kept making comments that the little evangelist could not quite hear. But that made everyone around the magician laugh. Suddenly, Saul turned to him and said, You work for the devil. Every night you stay up inventing schemes to cheat people out of God, but now you've come up against him yourself, and for that you're about to go blind for a while, unable to see even the sun. Eliamus smiled and said, Ha! But it ended in a high-pitched squeak, and suddenly his hand shot out. Help me, he cried. Help me. I can't see. Something's happening to me. I can't see. Help me. While Eliamus's friends clustered around him to soothe his panic, Saul waited patiently. Why don't you lead him to some place where he can sit down? He may want to hear this, he said after a few minutes. Then Saul gave his complete sermon uninterrupted. The proconsul appeared impressed. So were Mark and Elihu. Afterward, they asked him, How did you do that, Saul? I didn't. I was just praying and asking God what I should do, and God told me. That's great, Elihu said. Mark just looked sick. So how's the writing coming, Saul asked him, trying to change the subject. I've seen you scratching away there, and you've filled up one or two scrolls. Why don't you read some of it to us? Oh, I I don't want to do that, Mark stammered. Oh, come on, Barnabas insisted. We want to hear what you've written. You've been listening to all Saul's sermons. By now you must have many of them recorded. I am, um, this really isn't a good time. The young man stammered. Nonsense, boy, get them out. Let's see what you've got done. I'm not feeling well, he mumbled, but he unrolled one of his scrolls and began to read. The good news of Jesus Christ. The message begins here, following to the letter the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Watch closely. I'm sending my preacher ahead of you. He'll make the road smooth for you. Thunder in the desert. Prepare for God's arrival. Make the road smooth and straight. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 from the Message Bible. Did I quote that passage from Isaiah? Saul asked, puzzled. Go on, Barnabas urged. John the baptizer appeared in the wild, preaching a baptism of life change that leads to forgiveness of sins. People thronged to him from Judea and Jerusalem, and as they confessed their sins, were baptized by him in the Jordan River into a changed life john wore a camel hair habit tied at the waist with a leather belt he ate locust and wild field honey verses four through six i never said that saul frowned mark stopped continue barnabas said but that's nothing like what i have been preaching saul shook his head a confused expression on his face keep reading barnabas insisted are you sure? Mark asked nervously. Yes, keep reading. As he preached, he said, the real action comes next. The star in this drama to whom I'm a mere stagehand will change your life. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. His baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit, will change you from the inside out. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's Spirit looking like a dove come down on him. Along with the Spirit, a voice, You are my Son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. Verses 7 through 11. But I have never told that story. That's not in any of my sermons, Saul protested. Barnabas turned to Saul. No, he said, but it is the story of Jesus of Nazareth. Isn't that what you ask him to write? Well, you said that your nephew was a scribe and that he could write down some of my sermons and we could circulate them among the new converts. And this is not what we discussed. No, it is not what we discussed. Mark, I just wanted to write the story of Jesus. Your sermons are good, but they're all theology and history and why the Jews did this and the Jews did that and why Jesus was the Messiah. 
By the time they're converts, they want to hear more about Jesus, no, not more about what they've already heard. As Saul jumped to his feet, Barnabas did too. Now, let's think about this, Mark's uncle said. This, this could work. It could make good sense. After all, many people were with Jesus and knew him and saw him do a lot of things. It would be helpful to have a record of those stories. You, you might enjoy reading them. But it's not what we discussed, Saul replied. Your nephew hasn't done anything the way he was supposed to on this whole journey. He's young, afraid, and can't take our pace. I was looking for an assistant and a personal scribe, and this is not what I expected it to be. No, it's not, Mark said. None of it is what we discussed. And, I, and I'm not any happier than you are. He took a deep breath, shook his head, and said, I'm not cut out for this kind of traveling life. I don't want to be your personal scribe. I just want to write the stories of Jesus the way that they happened. This is totally unacceptable. Paul started pacing back and forth. Totally unacceptable. I'm sure we can work this out, Barnabas replied, trying to soothe the upset evangelist. You are one of the greatest preachers in our whole movement, but Mark's idea has value too, and there is, there is a place for that. There may be a place for both of us, Saul said after some moments, but I don't think it's together. Mark shook his head. No, not together. Barnabas sighed and thought for several minutes. Suppose I arrange passage for you back to Israel, Mark. Can you get back to Jerusalem on your own? The younger man nodded. You're almost to Pam Pamphylia. There's a harbor there. I will find a ship for your trip. Please continue your writing. It is something that we need, and no one has put the story of Jesus into writing. Perhaps there would be value someday in putting some of my words into writing, Saul muttered. Barnabas turned to him. Yes, we will find a scribe who will take down your words and send them to encourage the converts in the places we have been. Even when the Lord was here, he used many different types of people, and we didn't all get along either. So this shouldn't be shocking or feel like a failure to anyone. It's just the Lord's way, and we need to learn to work with it. This will probably not be the first time that people he has called to minister disagree and have trouble getting along. I laughed out loud. God's people have always had conflicts with each other and have always had trouble getting along. Barnabas was quite correct. It always seemed to me that my job would be easier if God had more followers like Barnabas and fewer like Saul and Mark. However, if there were, the work would not get done in the same way, for after all, the Lord made special use of both Saul and young Mark. He has great patience with humans. The rest of the trip to the port was tense. Barnabas, true to his word, bought Mark passage on a ship bound for Joppa. From there, the young man would travel home to Jerusalem on his own. After bidding him goodbye, the other three boarded another ship bound for Perga. From there, they headed up to Sidon, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Deirdre. It was a rough trip. Saul began to request that people now call him Paul. I'd like to take the name Paul, he said, in honor of the governor Sergius Paulus, who was very fair to us. Yes, he was, Elihu responded. I wonder whatever happened to Elimus bar Jesus. I don't know, but for now, please address me as Paul. Perhaps that will help me get away from the image of a persecutor, and more people will just listen to my message instead of worrying about what I used to be. Barnabas smiled. The Lord has forgiven everything you used to be. But if you would rather be called Paul, we would be happy to oblige you. The apostle launched into his preaching with new vigor in the town of Iconium. Soon the Jews in that town became furious and forced them to leave. While it was frightening, at least the missionaries encountered only the threat of violence. Couldn't you be more cautious, Paul? Elihu asked one day. More cautious, he replied incredulously. 
Well, not that you would water down the gospel or change anything that Jesus of Nazareth said, but you just make people so angry everywhere we go. I can't help it if they're angry at what I say. They got angry at Jesus, too. Elihu looked at Barnabas, who shrugged. Some people will always be angry when someone presents truth to them, Barnabas said, although there is a place for gentleness and diplomacy. I just preach it as it is, Paul muttered, pacing back and forth. I just preach it as it is. That's true, Barnabas acknowledged, and many people have accepted the gospel, Paul protested. And that's also true. But perhaps there's a way to preach it without making people want to attack you. Perhaps, Paul said slowly. I, I speak from the bottom of my heart. I mean every word I speak. But perhaps the two of us together. He looked at him, at Barnabas, imploringly. Yes, that's why the two of us are together. We'll preach together at Lystra, the next village along the road. Perhaps team preaching together will work better. I certainly hope so, Elihu whispered under his breath, because this is getting scary. As they approached the town of Lystra, they noticed a crippled man sitting by the gate. He heard Paul talking and looked at him. The evangelist walked over to him. Suddenly, Paul said in a loud voice, Stand up on your feet! At the same time, he pulled the man to his feet. To his amazement, the crippled man stood. Even when Paul let go, he kept his balance. Then he took one tentative step and still another. Suddenly, he began jumping and laughing and shouting. I can walk! I can walk! I've never been able to do this, not since the day I was born. Praise God! This is wonderful! People came streaming out of the houses and the market to see what had happened. They all started shouting and chanting, Praise the gods! The gods have come down! Praise the gods! Because they were shouting in their own dialect, Paul and Barnabas were not exactly sure what the people were saying, so they smiled and nodded. It must be Zeus and Hermias come down! Zeus must be the tall, good-looking one, and Hermias the one who talks a lot. He must be his speaker, they said pointing at Paul. Get the priest from the temple of Zeus. Quick, bring a bull. We must have a sacrifice immediately. The people continued to cheer. It seemed only a few minutes until the priest from the local shrine had assembled a parade. It consisted of banners and bulls and people dancing and shouting and getting ready for a sacrifice. What are you doing? Paul protested as he began to realize what was going on. Stop this! No, don't sacrifice a bull to us and don't worship us. We're not gods. No, no, Barnabas added. I am not Zeus, nor is he Hermias. But the people didn't understand. Elihu wished his friend Mark were there. Having gotten separated from Paul and Barnabas in the crowd, he glanced around frantically. This was Lystra. The town where his aunt should be. How would he ever find her in the huge crowd among all the pandemonium? Suddenly he noticed some men he had seen in Iconium. They went straight to the priest of Zeus and whispered to him. Then the city elders. Instantly the, ma the mood turned ugly. They're imposters! They're not gods at all! The priest roared. Stone them! Then the same people who had moments before shouted praises to those they thought were gods were now angry. The crowd surrounded Paul and Barnabas. Stop! Stop! Elihu screamed. He threw himself against the mob, trying to get through to see what was happening, but he couldn't. Little did he know that the people he struggled against were guardians stationed all around him so that he could not be injured in the melee. Finally, he gave up and sat sobbing on the stone steps of the Acropolis. Unknown to him, the angry crowd dragged his two friends outside the city gates. What is happening, God, he begged. Don't you see what's happening here? Paul can be abrasive, but he is your servant. He's preaching about you. Aren't you going to protect him? Can't you send someone to rescue him? As he sat, lost in grief and panic, someone approached him. Embarrassed and depressed, he didn't even look up, but just rested his head on his knees. 
You're a stranger here, a voice said. Elihu said nothing. What brings you to our town? Do you have business here? Still, he didn't answer. Come, come. The man shook him by the shoulders. You can speak to me. No one will bother you. The crowd has left. They're outside the city walls right now, beating up those two visitors. Are you with them? Glancing up at the man, Elihu nodded. Is your business here in this town just to cause a riot? Elihu shook his head. No, they're Christians. They've come to tell people about Jesus of Nazareth. But some of the Jews from Iconium, who were angry with them there, have followed them here. The people here are confused. Yes, I know. They thought they were Zeus and Hermes. Are you a preacher too? Oh, no. They brought me here because I was not safe in Jerusalem. I have an aunt who lives here. Really? What's her name? She's, she's married to a Greek man now. Her name was Eunice when she was at home with my mother. Ah, oh, the man said. She married a Greek. Must have really upset your family. I don't know. I guess when she married him it did. But now that my mother and I are Christians, we consider Jews and Greeks as equal. Really? And you believe this? Oh, yes. Then I will take you to your aunt Eunice. Your grandmother Lois is living with us too. Really? Living with us? Are you? I'm the Greek man that married your aunt Eunice. Come join us. We have a son your age. His name is Timothy. You two may get along pretty well. What about? Elihu glanced toward the gate. I can't do anything about that right now, but I can get you out of here before they return. Now we should be moving. Yes, sir. Elihu jumped to his feet and followed his newfound uncle home.